Under African Sun, read by the author Marianne Alverson. This book is dedicated to you, Keith and Brian, that you may remember and live again, Swan of Time and Wisdom. From Ecclesiastics 9.11 I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. Chapter 1. In the Iron Snake Munsu, you would be impressed. I'm not clutching a strap, nor am I squeezed and rocked on a wooden bench between the sweat and sound of others. I'm alone on a cushioned seat taking tea at a table with white linen, a basket of breakfast buns, and shiny little envelopes of sweet jelly. I'm traveling in the Iron Snake, riding not to the bowels of the earth in South Africa, like Sepati's son number 19, but from one American city to another. Look out the window, Munsu, and you see my America. Trees higher than any giraffe stand together so close that the ground is black in shadow. Here there are no sand paths to collect the sun, burn your feet, and lead you to your neighbors. Fields of firm, tall grasses blow idly in the breeze. Where are the women to pick the stalks and weave them into baskets? Where are the girls to chase birds from the grain? By the rail bed, you see clay holding yesterday's rain. What a rain! But look closely at the pool of water, Munsu. No animal tracks, no footprints encircle the edge of this dark liquid where fat for cars paints blue rainbows on its surface. We pass many kinds of water. The gods are generous here. The iron snake crosses over water so abundant you need not pray for more. The waiter comes to pour more tea and passes me little plastic cups filled with cream. If I use two of these cups, they will color my tea as did the drops we pumped out of Resakatli's reluctant goat. Munsu, you're probably sitting with Resakatli right now. That is if the old man is still alive. Surely the two of you are there on the lands. Rain or no rain, nothing would entice you to leave. You are as much as part of Botswana's countryside as the acacia tree. I picture the two of you seated by the hearth in the shade of the kitchen shelter, looking past the thorn bushes to the plowed field which is dry and wanting for rain. What would you say were you here with me in this train approaching a place of numbers? where hard black roads connect houses, row after row, known only by the numbers at the doors. Resakatli knows the cities. He would not change expression. But you, Munsu, would look for the hearth in the yard of every house and wonder at the smoke and flames coming out of the uneven concrete skyline. Resakatli would not exclaim or wonder in silence, but would instruct us both, as is expected of an elder. Those people on the platform stand shoulder to shoulder, not face to face. When one joins the group, he does not greet the others, for they are something to walk around like a post or trash can. Trash cans are brimful with refuse, and still more goods are thrown by the wayside. The waiter brings my bill. He moves around the table to the next and folds the corners of the tablecloth up over the plates of uneaten food and breakfast bun baskets, a feast for you, Monsu, to be swallowed by plastic garbage bags, which are twisted, tied, and tossed at the next station. If at the next station you were to enter this iron snake, following the right arm that leads you to your meals, you would join me here at the table. But would you recognize me, Monsu? Wearing a suit and toting briefcase, I look like any other white one, a lohoa, riding on her bottom to get from place to place. Look closely, Monsu, and you will recognize my face and gray-blue eyes, twelve years older. Twelve years ago we met under African sun. Lohoa, with a long yellow hair, why are you here on the lands of Sechatli's place? I'm with my husband, whom you call Modise. In America, where we come from, he's a teacher, and we've come here as a family with our two small sons to learn from the people of Botswana about how it is to live here. Truly, you come from America, but you are living here at Sechatli's place. You're not like the American Mavolontiri, Peace Corps volunteers, I've seen on the roadside who carry their clothes like a baby tied to their backs. You live here in the Lolapa like one of us, speaks at Swana, and learn Swana wisdoms from Sechatli. And from you, Munsu, 
Oh, it is a very long way for a foot to travel to gather bits of wisdom. Did you cross the sea in the thing that flies? No, we traveled slowly by ship and then by train. Oh, you rode to Botswana in the iron snake from the sea through the place of the Boers to Botswana? A, through South Africa. South Africa is the place of the Boers and apartheid. This apartheid is a poisonous animal, a skin pulled over its eyes so tightly that it cannot see Tswana wisdom. It's a good thing you've only passed through it and have come to Botswana, where we do not separate people by color, where people are people. The Tswana people across the border in South Africa are trapped in the hole of the Boers. They may see the rain fall on the field, but it is a field only for the Lehoa to eat from. In Botswana, everyone drinks from the same puddle. You have come to the right place to find Swana wisdom. Eh, hey, Munsu, what do you hear from Botswana in your America? Nothing, nothing, nothing at all. In the following moment of silence, my mind flashed back to nothing. Maps of Africa remained in the closets of my schoolroom. As a youth, my exposure to Africa was limited to fiction, Tarzan comics or stories of the fated hero rushing hopelessly across Sahara sands to collapse in a mirage. Films of famine and news reports from South Africa struck my consciousness, yet I continued to conceive of Africa distantly. It is good, then, Munsu jolted me out of reverie. You live here, collect your wisdoms, and when you go back to your America, tell them of our Tswana ways. Many years have passed since my husband Hoyt, Yor Modise, the anthropologist, has written the book on his fieldwork in Botswana. There's much talk of the poisonous animal living next door to you, but little is known or said about your Botswana. There's a great distance between us, and the time speeds like the iron snake. But to you, Monsu, I'm still Mao Keith, and my teenage sons, Keith and Brian, are an eight-year-old Tsotsi and a three-year-old Madala. From this train window, I see a vine and think of Maria's bougainvillea flowering scarlet in the sand and sharing dishwater with pig. I'm reminded of our arrival 12 years ago. Chapter 2. The Loloapa Between the setting sun and the rising full moon, we ended our long journey to Botswana. After driving our loaded truck down the last narrow, winding dirt road, we came to a Loloapa, three huts in a circle surrounded by a cracked mud wall a tree and some tall, spiny cacti bordering the goat crawl, and fields rose above the straw rooftops to the sunset sky. The truck stopped, the dust settled. Except for a few birds, there was an immense silence as Hoyt and I, Keith and Brian, walked through the mud walls into the courtyard. A man approached. His straw hat was the same shape and color as the thatched roofs of the huts. Over a white shirt, suspenders stretched to hold up a pair of large wool trousers. He walked straight and slowly towards us, his polished, worn, hobnailed boots thumping on the courtyard floor. Dumela ra utlotse jang, I heard Hoyt say. The Tswana handshake followed. The old man turned to me. I repeated my rehearsed Tswana greeting. To my surprise, he answered in English. I am Gustav Ernst Sachatle. He pulled up hand-hewn stools and chairs with seats of sparsely woven leather strips. In the twilight, the children and I listened to a mixture of Setswana and English as Hoyt and Rasakatli exchanged bits of family histories. Darkness never came. The brilliant moon casting our shadows across the courtyard floor shone on the old man's brown face. A small nose framed by wide eyes set far apart above his high cheekbones revealed his handsome youth. But for the few wrinkles that smiled with his eyes, his smooth, dark, clear skin showed no signs of aging. It was his lack of teeth, or shall I say the few stumps remaining, which first indicated that he was a man of some years, a mona mocholo, as a Tswana would say. It was the well-maintained, sparse white beard on his chin that expressed the authority and wisdom of a true mona mocholo. Courtyard, lolwapa, he said. You must call it Lolwapa and care for it well. Eh, Rasakatli, I replied. Ra is for other men, he corrected. You will be my children. I will be your father. You must say Re Sakatli to me. I am your Re Sakatli, he emphasized. Re Sakatli, we repeated in unison. 
Silence, an immense nighttime sky, a moon fuller than I ever knew it could be. I was overwhelmed with a sense of peace. We took only blankets off the truck that night. There'd be time tomorrow to unpack and organize. Even though I heard the rooster crow, I rolled over to sleep again. It was a different sound that woke us for the day, a din of human voices. Curious to know the source of the apparent commotion, Hoyt, the boys, and I dressed hurriedly and stumbled out into the sunlight of the Loloapa. A crowd of stares met my glances. Hoyt stepped forward to a gathering of men, greeting them and shaking hands. Brian, lured by what was probably the sandbox of his dreams, toddled off past the women to the dust outside the Loloapa walls. Bare-legged, barefoot boys with shirts and shorts that hung like rags moved in around Keith until he disappeared from my sight. I stood there, blinded by the sun and bewildered. We were on display. Facing me, a crowd of women tittered, laughed, and gawked. I could just stand there and wait for them to go, or I could try the Setswana greeting. But to whom should I go first? Frantically, I groped around for some sort of strategy, all the while feeling I was the butt of each cackle, every glare, and every pointed finger. Hoyt should help me, I thought. He got me into this. He's the anthropologist. He must know what all this means. He should have warned me, explained this. The should-haves led me nowhere. I couldn't appeal to him for help. He did not look particularly comfortable either there amidst the men pouring and passing a gourd filled with a seemingly coveted brown liquid. He took his turn, but his grin was obviously one more of relief than pleasure. And where is my newly adopted, calm, kind father? This Resagatli, he knows English, why doesn't he help me? I spotted him at the far end of the Loapa, sitting on the same seats we'd sat on the previous night, but this time he was with a small group of elders, passing and drinking that same brown liquid out of an old mayonnaise jar. Should I smile? That's safe, I smiled. Gathering from all areas of the Loapa and crowding closer together, the women surged towards me. I tried to turn myself into a spectator. I could be removed, merely watching this strange, exotic African ballet. Long skirts caught the dust raised by stomping bare feet. With their arms held high beside their heads, the women clapped left then right. From their swaying unison, an old woman stepped out. The ankle-length skirt matched her wrapped blue headscarf. Suddenly, she raised her arms. She darted straight toward me, shaking her open hands back and forth. Her fingers fluttered wildly. Her pink tongue rolled furiously, ululating a piercing trill. She charged aggressively into my space. A breath away, her shrieking tongue and flapping hands blurred my vision and deafened my ears. I stood there stupefied as she circled me again and again like a vulture. I froze in terror until, to my great relief, she retreated to her group. The dance wound down. The clapping chorus faded. To smile after perceived assault is difficult. My efforts surely were not convincing. Enough. I could not cope. The women settled down on the Loapa floor, and I stepped away from them. I withdrew to what little of my own world was left, and mechanically took to the task of unloading the truck to set up our home. This task could hardly render consolation. The straw mattresses which we tied on top of the truck were covered with fine red dust, the plastic sheets we'd used to cover them were thoroughly ripped. Three of the metal bed frames set up easily, but the fourth was badly rusted and hopelessly stuck. I unpacked a box of used camping gear, which had been loaned to us by the anthropology department at the University of Rutgersrand in South Africa. Aluminum pots, which rocked on any surface, candle holders with gobs of wax dripping, scratched plastic plates, and enamelware mugs stained with years of coffee. I set up the small metal folding table inside the hut and rummaged desperately through a disarray of boxes to find a cloth for it. A cloth on the table and four chairs around it, that would be home. The floor was just dried mud. I'd deal with that later. I carried clutter from the truck into the hut. No closets, of course. The suitcases would hold the clothes and at the same time support the sagging bed frames. I tried it out by shoving my suitcase under the bed and sitting down. Keith and Brian rushed in to remind me that they were hungry. The people had left, they said, and Daddy said we could eat now. Hoyt filled the one-burner stove with kerosene. 
He looked as lost as I felt. We didn't admit anything to each other. This brass primus stove actually has some shine to it, Hoyt said. Big deal, I thought, but opened the can in silence. Hoyt worked on the rusted bed frame. What's for dinner? Keith didn't wait for a response. He rushed right on with exuberance. This is really going to be fun. Join the Boy Scouts, I thought, while stirring the beans. Sure it is, I answered. What was I doing here? I wanted to cry, and Hoyt, I'm sure, had his misgivings. The glowing moon and stars and the silence of the night soothed us, but the chaos of our leap from 20th century urban life to rural Tswana existence whirled restlessly in my dreams that night. The next morning, she, the vulture, returned. Resagatli announced her arrival. It is Maria Mosou, he said to me. She followed a few paces behind her husband as they entered our Luapa. I recognized her blue scarf and faded skirt. She'd seemed to tower over me the day before, but now I noticed that she was actually a small woman, so slender and so old that bones protruded from her joints and deep-set wrinkles framed her eyes. Resagatli greeted her husband, Molefi, but Maria headed straight for me. I felt her eyes, and although this time she moved slowly, I stiffened, anticipating some strange encounter. She approached me with a red hen in her arms, and just as she passed it on into mine, Resagali stood by me, explaining, Ki mpo, it is a gift. I could have feasted on her smile, but the warm body and feathers now wriggling in my arms sought escape. As I wrestled to clutch it tighter, Resagali grabbed its feet, Slinging the bird upside down, he carried it to the hearth outside the Loapa. In a quick circular motion, he swept the hen's beak in the cool ashes and threw the bird in a nearby tree. It must sleep in the tree to be safe at night, Resagatli explained. The center of home is the ashes of your cooking fire. That is for the hen to know, he said, all the while staring straight at me. Thus my hen found its roosting place, and I, full of gratitude, asked Maria and Molefe to share our midday meal. We sat eating every morsel of cherished food. It was clear to me now that the day before had been a public welcome, and Maria's dance its most powerful display. Her rolling tongue was a ululation of joy. Determined to make up for my perplexed, unresponsive presence of yesterday, I now repeatedly broke the silence with my Setswana thanks. By the end of the day, the little table in our hut displayed the gifts brought one by one by our neighbors and visitors. A clay pot painted red, a handmade wire basket, a mozze and kika fashioned out of morula wood to stomp grain, and fresh eggs. Resakatli was careful not only to introduce each woman to me as she arrived, but also to point out which sand path led to our lolwapa. Take the sand path toward the sunset, and in front of Maria's hut, take the path Moja at your eating hand, the right. Go to the first path Molema at your plowing hand, the left, and you will find her Lolwapa. Since my introductions to the men were more perfunctory, I sensed that my relationships with the women would somehow be significant. Kintatabo, Resakatli announced as I watched another woman saunter down the sand path to our place. Her bony feet scraped the Lolapa floor as she approached us. I could smell the sweat that stained the two torn dresses which covered her round body and hung to her thick, scaly ankles. Her handshake, rough and firm, diverted my attention from bloodshot eyes to the heavy jaw and random teeth smiling at me. As I repeatedly shook hands face to face, my Setswana greeting felt less like abstract sounds and more like meaningful utterances. Ntatabo triumphantly presented me with a Tswana broom for the Loluapa. She'd made it from a bundle of bojang, a high reed-like grass used also for thatching. It was firmly woven and tied together at the grasping end. She showed me how to sweep by bending at the waist and using a broad, low, sweeping motion to take advantage of the full arm length of the broom. The loose dust flew out of the Loluapa through the closest mud wall entrance. I'd thought three entrances to be ornamental, but now the practical purpose was quite apparent as she swiftly moved from one third of the floor surface and its entrance to the other. With superbly efficient motions, she finished the job and then straightened up to pass me her gift, my new broom, my lefeelo. 
At sunset, Ntatabo, Resakatli Hoyt and I sat passing and sipping Kadi. Resakatli told us how to make it. Kadi is homemade brown liquid beer derived from the Kadi root. The Kadi plant thrives in a desert climate and is therefore abundant when nothing else can be harvested. Even though Bujalwa beer is universally preferred, its production is dependent on the sorghum harvest, ever linked to Pula rainfall and Modimo's will, God's will. Kadi, however, has the unique status of being the reliable year-round beer. The large round Kadi root is dug up, broken into many pieces, then dried for several days in the sun on the Luwapa floor. The brittle bleached pieces are added to a boiling mixture of brown sugar and water to cook. The liquid is poured into a clay pot covered with burlap and left to ferment for a few days. As in our own society, there was pressure to drink at social gatherings. Nevertheless, I could not be optimistic about acquiring a taste for Kadi. I took the gourd past me, let the rim touch my lips, and swallowed air, all the while trying to beam with satisfaction. We sat around the hearth to greet visitors one by one, a firm Tswana handshake with a Dume la ra or Dume la ma, followed by Otlo Tsejang. They smiled to hear me say it and repeated the greeting for me again. Resagatli passed the Kadi. My earlier fears and frustrations were gone. At ease among them, their gifts in my lap, I felt accepted. I could now comfortably enjoy the sights and sounds which would become a part of our every day. Life is simple here. To the east, the rising sun filters through a small forest of moshu trees. Resagatli rises to start the fire with wood collected the day before. He heats a bit of water to wash and puts a three-legged pot on for tea. Nearby, the cat and a stray dog lie lethargically, like skeletons in the sand. While I sweep, the rooster and hens, down from their tree, cluck about the yard and Luwapa, scrounging up a diet of insect and worms. The pig grunts constantly in search of food. This morning, as Hoyt swooped over the wash pan and the Luwapa with his face buried in a washcloth, the pig victoriously took off with a whole cake of soap. Resagatli laughed as Hoyt took chase, remarking that we needn't worry, for in the end justice would be done. He showed us long bars of soap he'd made with an earlier pig's fat. Each day defines itself. People come and we go on the winding sand path between crawl and fields nestled in thorn trees. As the sun lowers and the goats and sheep are returned to their crawl, I know it's time to set the fire to cook. We pause to sit on the wall, still warm from the day's glow and now reflecting the light of the fading sun. We face Resakali's field to the west, which, along with a single distant mountain, is our backdrop to each day's end. Some weeks after our arrival, Resakali announced he had hired a woman to make kadi and to plant and harvest beans when it's time. Her son, Moremi, will herd the goats, he said. They're destitute, and since Resakatli has no wife and family living with him, he must often hire help. In exchange for their labor, he will house and feed them. Keith will be expected to help Moremi with the animals. I certainly look forward to female help and companionship, for I can already detect that women's work in Swana society goes far beyond maintaining the Loloapa. Besides child care, usually delegated to older siblings, I've seen women sweep and smear floors. Just why and what they smear, I do not know. Women build walls, collect firewood and water, cook, wash, and plant and harvest the fields as well. What does that leave for men to do? I asked Resagatli. They send their sons to keep cattle, plow, and of course take the news over a good strong sip of kadi, he replies tolerantly, grinning at my curious presumption of equality. She, Mama Remy, arrived at midday, her son following closely behind. Tall and straight, she greeted Resakatli and removed a bundle from her head. The boy looked on, and when Resakatli turned to him, he extended his hand to the old man, mumbled a greeting, and settled himself in a shaded spot of the Luwapa floor. One bony shoulder protruded from the hole in his shirt. He folded his slender legs to sit small and inconspicuously in the shadow. Resagatli led her to the hut where they are to sleep. He returned to his chair and did not introduce us until she emerged from the hut without her load. She has a smooth face. Her gaze is distant, her handshake flaccid. I think she's about my age. She speaks a few solemn words in deep tones and withdraws. 
I pretend to understand with a casual nod of the head and the usual word of agreement, A. Eh. Quietly, she moves about the loapa, stacks sticks upon the hearth, and brushes Resakali's boots. Here is my closest female companion, Mamo Remi. Poverty surrounds us. We've brought what we considered basic essentials. So as not to be glaringly different, we are restricting ourselves to a minimum of gear. Now unpacked and set up, our rondavel hut contains a small red linoleum rug at the entrance, one metal folding table with two one-burner paraffin camp stoves, and another metal table with a set of plastic dishes, enamel cups, and assorted pots filled with eating and cooking utensils. The bedding and straw mattresses, already shaped to match the contours of our sleep, sag down to the suitcase wardrobes underneath the bed frames. Lined up along one wall are three rusted Boer War remnants, discovered en route through South Africa in a second-hand shop. Their ammunition boxes now filled with feast of dried and canned goods. On top of them are a first aid kit, a sewing box, a paraffin lantern, candles, and two flashlights. On the wall facing the entrance, a wooden swinging door. I've hung our tablecloth, a piece of Tswana material for a touch of home. Outside the hut, under its roof, are three 20 liter plastic water jugs, one paraffin container, and a metal wash basin. In the center of the Loapa, Resahatli keeps the four kitchen chairs. Their aluminum legs sparkle in the sun, and Resahatli, although preferring to sit on the hides of his own chairs, will pull up the blue plastic seats for his most honored visitors. Outside the Loapa walls, we have one 200 liter water drum, two bicycles, and a small blue Mazda pickup truck. In the field, a green canvas cloth supported on either side by poles hides our chemical toilet. We've brought a minimum of clothing, certainly nothing valuable, and the children have no toys other than a few books, paper, pencils, and a scissors. And meanwhile, in the rondavel next to ours, Mamoremi and her son Moremi sleep on torn burlap bags near the grain that Resahatli has stored. They flattened cardboard boxes to use for cover on cold nights. Their possessions, neatly stacked on the dirt floor, include a sweater, a shirt, one cup and plate to share, and an ink bottle with paraffin and wick. Like most of our neighbors, they eat with their hands, and the soles of their feet are like those we've seen daily shuffling into the Luapa, with nerves blunted by a lifetime of thorns, the pads are encrusted with dust and calluses. Resakatles and a few other homesteads have beds, a chair or two, iron pots, some dishes, perhaps a pair of shoes and change of clothes, a table, and possibly a radio or a bicycle. But no one owns a car. Our mini truck Mazda is a sign of wealth, bourgeois town life, and Mahoa, white, fat stomachs, Resakatles designation. We are white, the only ones ever to live in this community and it will be our task to establish an identity as individuals distinct from the stereotype of Mahoa. An old woman, Sepate, visits me often. She comes with a three-inch thorn stuck between her teeth and doesn't remove it when she speaks. Unlike Resakatli, her speech is quick and clipped. I try to make the most of a few words that come through, and to the rest I utter a eh, to appear to understand. She's content to sit on the loapa floor in silence when the conversation wanes. I'm not. Scraping her teeth with her toothpick, she looks out to the horizon, squinting her small eyes in the sunlight. I try again to engage her with a phrase Resagatli taught me the night before. She looks at me, cocks her head, and screws up her wrinkled face. She shakes her head and returns to her teeth, rolling the toothpick about with her tongue. I still have the attention of her eyes until she claps her hands and shrugs her shoulders with a slow, melodic sigh. While I am to sit with her, my elder, and be content, she returns to her far-off gaze. But tonight, after the sigh, her final resignation of our failure to communicate, I left her side to fetch our only bottle of wine. The men were not home. I poured the dark red liquid into two tin cups, and she, watching, smiled so broadly that the toothpick fell out. We applauded with laughter, and I poured on. Together we polished off the bottle. Although somewhat slurred, Sepati's speech slowed down, and I, relaxed and reeling, 
did not notice until later that I'd participated in my first fluent Setswana conversation. It's too bad that I cannot bide the taste of Kadi. Sepate, Hoyt tells me, means don't hide yourself. Often names recall events or conditions that occurred near the time of birth. In Sepati's case, her father disappeared just before her birth. She's also called Malesejo after her daughter Lesejo. Just as men can be called by the name of their first son, women are often called by the name of their first daughter. There are times, however, when women take the name of their son. Since Mama Remy only has her son Moreme living here, she's taken his name instead of her daughter's. And I, who have no daughter, am Mao Keith. They do not pronounce the T-H in Keith. Hoyt, also Rao Keith, has taken on a Tswana name, Modise, which means shepherd. Many names have meaning. Moremi, hewer of wood. Kirileng, what I said. Lekoto, leg or wheel. Mosimanihape, another boy. Tiro, work. Pulwane, mud wall. Munsu, black one. Kilkirwe, I have been cared for. Tabo, joy. Sejaro, obstinate. Mpo, gift. Ntatabo, their father. Ntatabo is a woman, and a man living nearby has the same name. Although division of labor and social patterns are determined by sex, it's interesting to me that most names have no gender connotation whatsoever. Mama Remy and I sweep together, and while I cook the morning mealies, a porridge of ground maize, she makes tea and milks a goat. If she's lucky, she can get just enough to color our tea, but this morning she's gone until after breakfast. She returns with a bucket on her head. Leafy branches float on top of the water to minimize splashing as she moves along. I remember spending days of my youth trying to balance books and competing with friends to see who could stack the most... But unlike Swana girls, we were playing only an occasional game. Here, young girls practice balancing on their heads as soon as they have learned to walk. And certainly, by the time they are five or six years old, they can comfortably carry a bundle of sticks or a sack of mealy. When Mama Remy sets down her load on the Lolwapa floor, I cannot resist lifting it, just to feel the weight. She smiles at my grimace as I struggle to lift the bucket up near my head. She reaches for the empty bucket on the stoop nearby and passes it to me. I take up the challenge and fail. She strokes my head and shakes her head. Yes, my slippery strands cannot grip as well as her kinky hair. She gives me a piece of cloth which she has wound to size and sets it upon my head to help support the bucket. This time I'm cautious enough to stand still with the bucket well balanced before moving. Slowly, I step out, and after a few steps, while it looks pretty good, I remove the bucket and place it back on the floor. Applause breaks out. I turn to see Resakatli and two other men praising my efforts. Modise, modise, they call to Hoyt. Ruri, que mosadi wa Setswana. Truly, she's a Tswana woman. Hoyt tells me there are various water sources, but all are far if you consider the weight of a bucket on your head. During the rainy season, from November through April, Mosoa's Dam, two kilometers away and usually just a sand river, does collect some water. After heavy rains, deep puddles accumulate on the dirt roads. Rivers, dams, and puddles are the common source of water, even though a number of bacteria thrive in them. I do not think people here associate the risks of their water supply with the diseases and deaths they suffer. They take no precautions. Just boiling the water before drinking could prevent many common and sometimes fatal illnesses, gastroenteritis, dysentery, typhoid, and bilharzia. The dry season is upon us. People rely on the well of the BAC, the Botswana Agricultural College, four kilometers away. Or, if they can pay the minimal fee, they use the pump at the Lahoa farm just three kilometers north. I was worried about our dwindling water supply until Hoyt returned home from a trip to town with news. He'd met a Vermont farmer. How did you know he was from Vermont? He was wearing those green overalls and a Sears and Roebuck shirt. His name is Elwyn Miller. He and his wife, both in their 60s, are living as Peace Corps volunteers in the BAC. He offered to let us use their water and garden hose to fill our water drum. But that's not all. He offered to let us use their bathroom for showers. Glory, 
I was ready to go right away and headed for the hut in pursuit of towels when a car drove up. The sound of a motor is an event, a car, a most significant arrival. We all stopped and turned and looked at a TJ license plate, Transvaal, Johannesburg, South Africa. Resigali tucked in his shirt, lifted his suspenders and rose. Hoyt immediately recognized Kerry Leng, the woman who tutored him in Setswana during our two-month preparation stay in South Africa. Resigali greeted Kerry Leng, his niece. It was good, Resigali told her, that she'd sent the American family to live with him. Yes, Hoyt agreed. Everything had turned out very well. My clipped concurrence lacked enthusiasm. Kerileng looked at my eyes, fixed on her clean summer dress, nylons, and dust-free shoes. She smiled knowingly and unwrapped a parcel of brown paper. She held a dress made of brown swana cloth up to my shoulders. I hope it fits, she fussed, while Resagali expressed his pleasure. Oh, lu, lu, lu was not exactly what I would define as a height of fashion. Yet Resichatni's continued oh, lu, 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 and Kiri Leng's proud confirmation of her selection left me no choice but to be absolutely delighted with my new Tswana dress. It has an apron to match, she continued. You will look like a real Tswana woman, she said. Indeed, Kiri Leng was determined to make a Tswana woman out of me. The next day she had a lesson plan. You must learn a Khudila Boloko, she insisted. What is it? I asked. Do you see the lolapa floor is hard like cement? We can just sweep the loose dust and dirt out of the lolapa walls and there's good clean floor. But do you see here? She showed me. Places where the floor is broken up and loose like the sand outside? This happens. Children play and dance. Chairs scrape. Vaisakatli pounds nails into his goatskins. You must fix this floor so it will be smooth and hard again. How? I asked. You smear it with a fresh mixture, and after it dries in the hot sun, it will be hard. How often do I have to smear it? Uh, you have many using this loapa. Maybe you will have to do it once every month. What do I smear it with? With the fresh mixture. Come, I'll show you. She grabbed a bucket and led me to the fields. There's a very good place down this path here where Tabo keeps his cattle. Oh, I could see this coming. She diligently bent down and scooped up cow dung to throw into the bucket. I stood stiffly at her side, looking into the horizon, and tried to forget where I was. This layer here is nice and fresh, she chirped, and there's plenty of it for use later on. We can go back to the Luapa and mix. Back to the Luapa, fine, I replied. I stood in the Luapa. Kirileng set the pan of wet cow manure and clay dust at my feet. Come, let us get started, she commanded. Ugh, what now? She poured water into the manure and mixed it with her hands. Scooping up a palmful and using circular motions, she quickly spread it and smeared it over an area of the loapa floor. Can't just stand here. I gotta get down there next to her and get it over with, I thought. Assuming there would be a stench and distorting my face, I went down on my knees, propped myself up with my left hand, and dove my right into the pan. I threw a blob onto the floor and spread it out. She started to sing. The hot sun dries it as it spreads, I noticed. Better sprinkle water on as I work to keep it smooth. And then the sudden recognition. There is no smell. Relaxed, I worked on. My mixture was too thick. The trick is to work wet and thin, and in the process of scraping off the last excess layer, make a bold design to dry in place. She worked fast and left a good design. As I was just beginning to enjoy my quest for a good pattern, for some reason my mind flashed back to a tennis court. The ladies in their whites, having finished a set, were just sipping cold lemonade through straws. Unbelievable. I'm happy here and now smearing shit. Mama Remy joined us. I tried to follow their song. Mama Remy asked in Setswana what we call boloko in America. Cow manure. She tried, but couldn't pronounce it. She asked again. Dung. She tried again without success. Shit, I yelled impatiently. Shit, 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 she repeated proudly, for boloko is a treasured word. 
I'd feared the smell of boloco and found there was none. Was it because of the diet of the cattle or the effect of the hot sun? I did not question my own sense of smell. There were, after all, daily smells difficult to tolerate. French royalty had their perfumes and powders. At the onset of puberty and throughout adulthood, we have Madison Avenue working for us. All this is as far away as the tennis courts. There's a certain strong, acrid smell impossible to ignore. It's by far the worst odor around here, body odor. I think it's caused by sweating into dirty clothes, which then absorb the smoke of the evening fire. Nevertheless, we sit close together and pass the cadi, and in the process we've managed to get used to the smell of human poverty. Hoyt speculates that this is perhaps because we have not yet had our showers. After his next anthropological rounds, he assures us we will all grab towels and soap and drive off to the miller's bathroom at the BAC. As promised, we drove from the crawl to the suburban community of the BAC. The Botswana Agricultural College is one of the many government agencies staffed by foreign experts from various Western countries. They have two to five year contracts to work within the government and help achieve Botswana's national progress. Whereas most of the government agencies are centered in the capital, Habaroni, the Agricultural College offices are located outside of town near the experimental farms. Those expatriates working for the college are housed directly on the premises. It is a fenced-in area with two main roads. Each house has its own fence with tsaba ncha, beware of dog, on almost every gate. It has a driveway and garage, well-manicured lawn with flowers, servants' quarters, and perhaps a swimming pool. Even from the front of their house, the miller's habitation looked unique. The gate was open, the garden overgrown. There were no servants. The millers were not at home, yet the front door was unlocked. Mr. Miller had assured Hoyt that we could come in to shower at any time. We did not hesitate. Squeaky clean. While waiting for the family, I sat in the sun of the miller's backyard, looking over the fence at the neighbor. She sat in the shade in a light summer dress, reclining on a lawn chair. On a round table set with ironed linen, the maid set down two glasses of iced drink. A toddler splashed in a flowered plastic pool on the lawn strewn with plastic toys. We drove back to Resacatle. Brian is playing with sticks in the dust. He's still afraid of the pig, and when it snorts near him, he runs into the loapa to grab my knees. Keith and Moremi are just coming back across the field with the goats. The sun is low, my signal to start supper. I'm just about to get up when Resakali puts his hand on my knee. We sit alone together in Luapa. Gemon na moholo, I'm an old man. Eh, Resakali, ke itse sintle. Yes, I know it well. In Setswana, he tells me that he has watched me closely. I cannot get every detail, but I understand his message. I work as a Tswana woman, and since he has no wife living with him, I'm to be the Mosadi Moholo. Old woman. Kitumetsi tatara ki Mosadi Moholo. I'm very thankful, sir. I am the old woman. I'm sure this is an honor, just why I'm not yet certain. Ki Mosadi Moholo. Chapter 3 Toward Manhood. Keith and Moremi disappear in the late morning to take the goats and sheep to pasture. Moremi, at 13, is small for his age, and the five-year age difference between them is barely visible. Both boys, curious about each other's worlds, are beginning to communicate despite the language barrier. When Moremi finally got up the courage to stroke Keith's t-shirt and smile, Keith, suddenly aware of the rag on Moremi's shoulder, responded by replacing it with a shirt of his own. Clad in his new t-shirt, Moremi puffed out his chest and spun himself around. Laughing, they ran off to the goat crawl. I could hear their voices above the goats and sheep now mang and pushing their way through the crawl door for the freedom of the fields. Their voices faded, sticks in hand. They walked slowly far out into the distance, two boys, one dark, one light, two brightly striped t-shirts moving within and around the grazing herd. Convinced that the transition to a different language and culture is less complicated for a child, and also observing with perhaps some degree of envy 
the ease and spontaneity between the boys, I was not prepared for Keith's glum face upon his return. He ate his supper in silence, but just as I came to bid him good night at his bedside, his eyes filled with tears. Bewildered, I cradled him, while he heaved with sobs and tried to get out the words. Moremi is cruel to the goats. He wouldn't let the limping goat stay in the crawl. He pushed it out. He made it go on. I tried to stop him. He laughed. He beat it. He kept the baby goat away from its own mother. It wanted to drink. He wouldn't let it. Why is he so mean? He never pets them. As I was just about to launch into a soothing discourse on let's try to understand Moremi, he interrupted. And the goats don't even have names like in Heidi. The curtain lifted, Heidi, yes, he'd read it and loved it, and here was his chance to love and protect the goats. Amazed, I listened to him tell of the various goat families. He shared the minute details he'd so keenly discovered. But before he fell back on his pillow to sleep, I tried to tell him just what I'd been trying to tell myself these past days. Keith, we're in another place, another time. It's not like home where we have animals as pets to feed and cuddle, to take to the vet or enter in a show. It's not like Heidi's Alps, where the goat's creamy milk keeps the children's cheeks rosy. I don't know why Moremi acts this way. Stay with him, watch him, try not to judge him. See if you can find out why. Maybe there is a reason that isn't cruel. And if you can learn something new, tell me, because I would like to understand it with you. He was asleep, and I continued to talk across the dark corners of the hut. Resagatli looked rather disgruntled the next morning when Mamoremi's old mother and Mamoremi's three daughters pitched up, blanket roll in hand. They tossed their things in the storage hut, thus indicating that they would sleep in the crowded space already occupied by Mamoremi and Moremi. There's a family resemblance, although Resagatli claims to know that each child is of a different father. They are all dark brown, tall, and very slender, and both Mamoremi and her mother have the same stately walk and graceful movements. Mamoremi told me of her family. Her oldest daughter, 16-year-old Morwadi, is married to a man in town with a job. They have an infant son, Diepe. Three other daughters, Mpo, 10, Laraka, 8, and Elina, 4, live with her mother in Old Naledi, a poor squatter's section of town. With no husband to help, Mamoremi and her mother must support the growing family. Sources of income are limited and lacking formal education, they are not employable in town. Since they speak no English, they cannot work as domestic servants. While Mamoremi and her only son, Moremi, have hired themselves out to Resagatli, her mother brews beer for various households in Old Naledi. A jar of kadi is sold for five cents. She receives a small brewing fee per jar sold. Particularly skilled in the art of smearing floors and building decorative walls, she can also earn a certain amount after the rainy season when many households may need help rebuilding. Upon arrival, the old woman greeted me with a poetic flourish that I could not totally understand. In conclusion, she stated, I have no gift to give you, woman of America, except the gift of my hands. She held up her large, knotted hands for me to see. She shook them and stretched them to the sky, and within minutes she was at the door stoop with Boloco, making a beautiful pattern. Resagatli, to make sure no one was idle, sent Mamoremi, Mpo, and Leraco to fetch water to brew more kadi. Brian and Elena found each other, chasing squawking chickens with sticks and squealing with delight they ran off, and Resagatli pulled me aside for a serious talk. He spoke in Setswana, slowly and clearly, repeating words as he studied my face. It was time, he said, to honor our arrival. That night he would choose the goat. The next day it would be slaughtered for a feast. I think he described the details of the coming slaughter to calm my furrowed brow. It, of course, had the opposite effect, my hasty response, which went something like, Oh, you needn't do such a thing for us, met with a patient smile. The next day would be a day of great honor, a day of great joy, he repeated. I managed to thank him, although I know he read my anxious face with some puzzlement. Hoyt entered the Luapa. Modise, Resagatli called out to him. 
I rushed over to Hoyt as he headed for the old man. Hoyt, he's going to slaughter a goat for us tomorrow. You've got to stop him, I pleaded. Hoyt, who spent half of his youth on a Virginia farm, was delighted by the news. He went to sit with the old man and they passed the cadi. Hoyt must have explained my sentiments, for when Resagatli finally got up from his chair, he came to me. He patted my shoulder and said that if I did not want to watch the slaughter, I could stay in the hut. There would be many other feasts that I would enjoy properly. He assured me that when I cooked the meat and served it and tasted it, I would come to know the honor that he had bestowed on us. I closed the wooden door and the shutters of the two small windows of our hut. Sunlight streamed in through the cracks anyhow. Brian and I were not huddled in darkness, but in the relief of shade, well isolated from the festivities outside. To three-year-old Brian, it seemed like a good time to play games alone with Mama, but my lack of enterprise and attention surely disappointed him. As he proudly arranged food cans to size and stacked them on the floor, I mechanically acknowledged his efforts while my mind was elsewhere. Keith had refused to join us. With disbelief, I heard his proud voice tell me that today was the day of slaughter. I did not believe he knew what he was saying. Resahatli says Kir Kirwe is the best man for slaughter in the whole village. Resahatli sent for Kir Kirwe, and he tapped me on the shoulder to help him. He only asked Likoto, Moremi, and me. Resahatli says it's a man's job. I'm to hold the leg down, and Moremi gets to do the other, and... Was this the child that cried in my arms? At this point, our neighbors, Tabo, Polwane, and their seven children entered the Loapa. They approached me. Moremi stood waiting behind Keith as he urged me to understand. I wanted to be alone with my son. Mamoremi poured kadi for the laughing voices seated by a nearby wall, while from the kraal, Resagatli and Hoyt walked with Keokirwe as he dragged the goat toward a tree. Our neighbors now faced me, tall Tabo smiling kindly, and Polwani, seemingly half his size, shyly at his side. I wanted to be alone with my son. Keith and Moremi ran toward the men, pulling the goat. Tabo greeted me, as did his eldest son, Nikoto, who announced that he would help with the goat. Tabo smiled proudly, and they left, father and son. His wife, Polwane, greeted me in a voice barely audible, but as she instructed the seven children lined up behind her to step forward, she broke out in a full, rolling Tswana voice. Mosi Manihape, he's my second son and the herder of our cattle. Lerato, she is my oldest daughter, going to school each morning with Lekoto. And here is Tiro. You must know him because he herds the goats and sheep with your son and Tatabo's son, Sejaro, and with Moremi. The children were quick to disappear after each introduction, and in conclusion, Polwani passed me a melon. Melon had been their food for the last three months, she said. Melon and mealy. Compieno, ritla janama. Today we will eat meat, she exclaimed joyfully. Em, I replied. More people were coming down the path. I found Brian and led him to the hut. Any minute, I thought, Keith might barge through the door, and eventually he did. But it was not, as I had expected, the actual slaughter that caused him to seek refuge. He announced that he'd done his job. He'd held the leg and watched the blood drain from the goat's head into the metal pan. Kekiwe had taught him a Tswana proverb, and Hoyt had explained it. Man is like a sheep. He does not cry out, even if he is in pain. Mono kinunko halele, Keith recited. With other children, he had gathered branches to set under a tree to catch the dripping blood as they lifted the goat and hung it by its feet. Horrified, I listened. What had transpired in these past weeks between Keith and his environment to give him the desire to participate in slaughter? Who spoke with him and when? What did he understand? Monna kenku ha'alele, he repeated perfectly. He understood the words. Before me, at that moment, stood a Tswana boy with a Tswana sense of manhood. I could not recognize my son. And yet it was I, not long ago, who pleaded for his tolerance for another culture. Why did you come to me now? I asked. Because Keo Kirwe slit the stomach and it was awful seeing the guts hang out. They were not guts, I corrected him. 
Not knowing what it is to become a man in Swana society, I could not understand Keith's casual references to the killing. It was the killing itself that posed problems for me. The corpse, as long as I was not party to its death, could, in my mind, be distinguished from the thought of the living animal. At grocery meat counters, I'd not thought of slaughter. I had dissected animals for science classes without pondering their demise. Once an animal was dead and hanging from a tree, revealing the mysteriously perfect organization of its bodily functions, the zoology lab dissections of my yesteryear triggered an intense desire on my part to pull Keith out of the hut to that hanging corpse for a lesson in anatomy. Brian, whom I'd quite forgotten, ripped me out of my lecture. He stiffly pointed up to the hanging goat and shouted out anxiously, Why don't it wake up? Wake it! Wake it! Back in the hut with Brian, I fried goat livers and onions and spice on my paraffin stove, and together we sang every nursery rhyme in our repertoire. We sang every verse of his favorite Sing a Song of Sixpence three times over. When we emerged with a plate of meat, I passed it to Reserati. He dipped his fingers and passed it on to a waiting hand. Hoyt, as is his fashion, expressed his delight and complimented my cuisine. Kirkirwe, stirring the meat for all in a very large three-legged black pot, stopped now and then to munch on his reward, the boiled stomach prepared by Mama Remy's mother. Resagatli, Tabo, and a group of elders, with a cooked head in a pan by their feet, bent over to tear meat off with their fingers. Resagatli motioned to me to sit near him, and pointing at the goat head, explained, We share the whole of this beautiful goat. This head is for elders, Resagatli looked proudly at the picked-over skull. Each part of this goat is for someone, and the skin is for you. Did you see the skin? It is a beautiful one. Some day you will have enough skins to sew together. Thank you, Resagatli, my Setswana voice drifted as I fought to hide my repulsion. Mosadi Moholo, Mao Keith, he spoke with emphasis. Where you come from in America, do they kill the goat only when it is time? I've seen places in town where they kill and kill and kill, where they pile the meat so high. His, his arm shot out past my chin. It is too much, and they do not know where is the head or the skin of that goat. He did not wait for a response. Madala, Resahatli called out, signaling to Brian. Madala, he called again. Brian toddled over to the old man's lap. Resagatli dipped his hand into soft, cooked meat, neatly piled up next to the skull. He dangled the revolting gray mass in Brian's face. Brian ate it, and Resagatli delighted in his motions for more. They shared the meat. Madala, he said tenderly, this meat only for you and for me. Here you are the youngest, and I am the oldest. This is good for us. We have not all our teeth. The wisest and the oldest of the old men in Zululand is called Madala. And because you and only you are young and close to the Badimo, where I will soon travel, you I will also call Madala. After sundown, in the quiet of the Loapa, once again, I sat with Resagatli. Like this Loapa, and like this hut, and like the shadow of this hut given by the moon, life is round. We travel in a circle from the Badimo back to the Badimo. He turned to me. You are Mosadi Moholo. Certainly, you have a husband, you have two sons, growing to be men. You are a Mosadi Moholo, so you are close to the Badimo. All the younger ones must hear you, and you must tell them things. Maria and Sepati, like you, they are Mosadi Moholo, but they are closer to the Badimo than you because they are even older than you. You must hear them. But I am a Mono Moholo, an old man, he emphasized slowly. I am the Madala, and pointing his finger at me with an air of authority, spoke out forcefully and I am closest to the Badimo. Hoyt blew out the candle that night. 
I covered the sleeping Madala, and we went to Keith's bedside. It was a very good feast, he reminisced, with all the boys, Moremi, Mosimanihapi, Tiro, and Sijari. He had raided the pot for leftovers behind Resahali's back. They danced to the radio and played games in the sand. I know why Moremi doesn't name the goats. People are hungry here, and goat is meat, he said simply. Keith, you did a fine job helping today, Hoyt responded. We bade him good night and walked out under the clear nighttime sky to the fire. It was early this morning that Keith, feeling quite left out, petitioned Resahatli for a Setswana name. The time had not yet come, the old man replied. He looked into a disappointed face. It is true, you were a man yesterday, but you are still a boy today. I will watch you, and I will find your name tomorrow. Tomorrow came. It was on a relaxed Sunday afternoon. Neighbors visited while their children played around our Loapa walls. The girls settled under a tree to play games. One by one they tossed a stone high up in the air, and before catching it again they grabbed for other stones which had been tossed on the sand. It looked to me very much like the game of jacks. On the other side of the same tree, near the Loapa wall, the herd boys leaned forward in concentrated silence while watching two age mates play Morabaraba. Morabaraba, like chess, requires both a long-range offensive and defensive strategy. The playing lines are drawn into a smooth, hard sand surface. The two opponents each collect their pieces by finding twelve small colored match stones. The object of the game is to capture all of the opponent's pieces through a series of moves along specific lines. Tiro with his black stones and Sejara with his red ones are recognized masters. When they compete, the other boys look on. Keith had tried unsuccessfully all week to defeat Tiro. He was not deterred when he noted that neither his father nor I could do any better. He had just suffered another loss. When I pointed to the hut and asked him to bring me the scissors, kicking up the dust, pouting and shouting, I don't want to, he walked off to retreat with a book. I didn't ask if you wanted to, now please get them, I insisted. His continued open defiance and my attempts at persuasion visibly shocked both children and elders near us. The small group of women squatting on the floor round a fresh melon half stopped spitting seeds. One after the other, Maria, Sepati, and Tatabo got up, kicking the floor and pouting to imitate Keith's rebellious gestures. Pulwani laughed, pointing to her children who mimicked and mocked Keith's glance and shrug while repeatedly singing out their chorus version of his English, I don't want to. The men sitting on chairs laughed in the sunlight of the Loapa, and I, feeling very ill at ease, sighed with relief when Keith threw the scissors into my lap. Suddenly, I became painfully aware that as long as we have lived here, I've never seen a child argue with or openly disobey an elder. A parent commands once, and the child runs to comply. Yet commands rarely need to be issued, since children clearly know their duties toward not only their parents, but any older sibling as well. Children are a source of labor. It is important to have a large family to run the household. A family with few children must, at times, find other hands to help. How often have women sympathetically commented to me on my failure to have daughters to do the sweeping? Empathetic Sepati re recommended that I see Resakatli for my fertility problem. Older daughters haul water and pound grain, while younger ones strap babies on their backs to sweep or collect firewood. While older sons go off to the cattle post, their brothers learn to trap wild animals or carve an axe handle while they tend the animals of the crawl at home. As soon as they are weaned and walking, the primary goal of child rearing is to introduce the children to their rules and obligations in the hierarchy. Once this is accomplished, children can learn from the older siblings the prerogatives they will have to, towards their juniors. 
What discipline techniques are used toward the disobedient child, I wondered. Even if expectations and roles are clearly defined, defiance must be encountered now and then and reprimanded. Later on, Hoyt told me that a child, if he makes excuses, refuses to obey, or sometimes even if he errs in the execution of a task, is lectured about his wrongdoing and punished. If it is a serious matter or a second offense, the child is usually beaten. Discipline of this sort is not only a parent's duty, but also the accepted responsibility of another elder or sibling in the absence of a parent. Suddenly, Ressa Kotli called to Keith. Takwana Gwana, come here, child. He motioned me to join them. There is a Twana saying, he stated. Molemo Wanwana Kehorongwa. The reward of a child is to be sent. That is its honor. He turned to Keith. Every older person in the village is your brother, is your father, is your mother. You know to greet properly, but still you do not know how to talk. Your manners are torn by town living. We see them come back, he said to me. Boys and men with manners rotted in town. They do not greet. They do not talk. They have sounds in their pocket but they have lost the Tswana law. And turning to Keith with a warm yet chiding smile, he presented Keith his Tswana name. When I o Tsotsi. You are Tsotsi. Tsotsi, Tsotsi, the children sang out. Tsotsi, the people of the Luapa repeated with laughter. Keith, you have your Tswana name now, I explained to my bewildered son. He flashed a broad grin, repeating the name over to himself. Tsotsi, I like the sound of it. A Tsotsi, Keith, is a naughty town boy, Hoyt explained that night. Hoyt and I tried to translate Resekhate's message, which Keith, interpreting literally, had not understood. When you are no longer a Tsotsi, you will get another Tswana name, we reassured him. But Tsotsi sounds good to me, he retorted. I don't care what it means. And asserting his independence, he repeated, I like Tsotsi. Okay, sleep well, Tsotsi, we replied as we hugged him good night, giving them things. Then turning to Mamoremi, Resakatli told her that except for Moremi, her family should leave. Many hands I like at work, but I do not like them at meals, he said. They left as they had come, the old woman and three children disappearing barefoot down the dirt road to town. Often while washing clothes, I sit near Resakatli and we talk. Also, in the late afternoons, he likes to call me to his side for a chat. Priding himself on being my Setswana teacher, he patiently corrects my grammar and helps me with words. We both enjoy these moments together. But today, as we worked side by side, there was tension between us. According to Tswana custom, a comfortable preliminary chat must precede any specifically planned topic. It is bad manners to talk business before greeting and telling each other the news. It was for this reason that we were now talking. I reminded myself to heed Tswana manners, to avoid disputing an elder, if my views contradicted his ideas, I would have to express them indirectly and inoffensively. He was preparing what he calls his medicals, this time for a woman who complained of severe menstrual cramps and irregularities. He was peeling a root which looked much like a red onion, but without its smell. He said that after cutting it up and pounding it into a fine powder, he would mix it with special herbs. He told me of his preferred specialty, fertility problems. With his medicals, he had helped many women every year, and several of them had honored him by naming their children after him. At this point, he put a piece of the root to his mouth to show me that it was not poisonous. Europeans, he said, did not believe in traditional cures. I assured him that I trusted his knowledge of plants and that many villagers had told me of his curing powers. He was pleased. I had learned much of Tswana ways, he said, but every day 
There was more to teach me. Some lessons had been difficult for me, he continued. A Resafatli, I agreed. You feed Mamoremi and Moremi too much. If Moremi is full, he only plays. A child must be hungry to work. Food is not something easy. Food is a great reward. Resafatli, you are right. Food is a great reward. Has Moremi forgotten his duties? No. Certainly he must tend the goats. But you must weed a garden before it is overgrown. I see a shirt on his back. I see you send him plates of food. You will spoil him if I do not stop you. I give him tea in the morning and mealies at night. That is his reward. You are a good man, Rasakatli. You have taught me many things. You once told Keith, that here every older person in the village is his brother, is his father, is his mother. You said I was the Mosari Moholo. Moremi is another son to me. Certainly he can be your son, but he's here to work for me, and you must give him nothing. You also must not spoil Mamoremi, he continued. You give her blankets, you give her water. She's getting lazy. I will not give Mama Remy water. I will not feed her and Moremi if it makes you angry. But it makes me sad because I like to share what I have, just as you share your home with us. The nights are cold, he compromised. She can keep the blanket, but you must know she too is here to work for me. Moremi is here to herd my goats. You must not get mixed up in this business. Eh, Rissakatli, I agreed. But he knew nonetheless that I did not understand him. It's difficult when learning the customs of a new culture to distinguish a person's individual stance from the culturally prescribed one. From my observations so far, however, I see that it is the custom to share resources in a homestead. I conclude, therefore, that much of Resagatli's reaction to my generosity towards Mamoremi and her son is based on his view of their role as servants. He is not willing to let them participate as family members. Relegating Mamoremi and Moremi to servant status makes me personally uncomfortable, even though Hoyt assures me there is a basis for stratification in traditional Tswana culture. Nevertheless, in this community, rather than stratification, we are experiencing only generosity and cooperation between households. I can conclude, therefore, that Resahatli, for his own pleasure, wants nothing to interfere with his master role and Moremi's servant status. There is within me a strong desire to judge him harshly. Yet further thought, as is often the case, must squelch this passion. If, as Hoyt says, there is stratification within Swana culture, tradition may tolerate a master-servant relationship for reasons that I, of a different age, sex, and culture, can never accept or understand. When do ultimate humanitarian principles override cultural prescriptions? And then again, Perhaps Resahatli's reaction is not culturally prescribed, but a mere personal adjustment to his particular situation within his society. He lives alone in a society where a man's wife and children are his greatest assets. Clearly, in my ignorance of Resahatli's personal life and culture, I cannot judge him at all. Yet a tremendous curiosity about this modala, Resahatli, has awakened in me. It was not until just a few days ago that I first noticed why he always seems to be pointing with his right index finger. I thought it was in an authoritarian pose, but no, he's missing parts of his last three fingers. Resahatli, I uttered in surprise. I did not know you were missing fingers. I'm sorry. What happened to you? I asked. It is nothing. I'm a Madala, anyhow, he declared. How did it happen, I persisted. It is a long time ago, when I grew to be a man. Someday I may tell you, but not now, Mosari Moholo, not now.